One, two, three judges. Excellent. Well, for our final hearing on Sunday, for this particular Unit 3 panel, uh, welcome to Maggie Walker Governor's School from Virginia. My name is Emily Voss. I am the State Coordinator for Virginia. And in just a moment, I will have the judges introduce themselves, and then they'll invite you to introduce yourselves and your coach. It will not at all surprise you that we're gonna be working with question two this time, um, but they'll go ahead and read it for the benefit of the recording. And then they'll kick off into your prepared statement and the follow-up questions after that. So everybody relax. The judges are excited to have a great conversation with you. And I'll also be your timekeeper. If you happen to be in the middle of a thought when I hold up the time sign, please feel free to finish your sentence. Um, it's totally fine. Okay. All right, judges, please take it away. Oh, yeah, she seemed so sweet and so nice and so friendly. She was just in our breakout room and she told us if we asked you any hard questions, she was going to mute us and send us back to the breakout room from hell. Um, you know, don't don't be taken in by all of that. She warned us about how nice we're supposed to be to you. And uh, so we're not taking don't be confused that in any way by that we're going to be real nice. Um, good morning, afternoon. What time is it? It's 2.30 where you are. It's 1.30 where I am. So um, I know y'all have had a long day. We have too, but we've saved a, a school we've been looking forward to hearing all day long. We've been looking forward to hearing you. So last, let me let the guys introduce themselves to you and then I'll call on you. Dr. Rogers, you want to say hello? You're muted, Don. Yep, yep, got it. Yeah. So um, uh, hello students, it's good to see you. I'm Donald Rogers from Central Connecticut State University um, where I recently retired. Um, I've been uh, judging We the People for many years. Uh, it's a great program and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, your voices on, on the question of the day. And my, yeah, my name is uh, Joe Stewart. I teach in the political science department at Clemson University in South Carolina. Very much look forward to hearing from you, to learning from you today. Relax, we're going to have fun. You can educate us about Unit 3, and I've worked with your teacher, so I'm sure he, like us, will learn from, from this also. So uh, uh, we're, relax, we're going to have fun today. And I'm Mike Miles from Birmingham, Alabama. Samuel usually grades the judges after we're through, so I hope we do well enough today to I think he and I have been in the hearing room so many times together. Samuel, I think you and I are brothers by two different mothers or something like that, but we've known each other a long time. I'm glad I don't have to spell his last name on my checks, but otherwise, it's good to see you again, my friend. Good to see you. Welcome back. All right, let's see. Tell us who you are so we can turn things over to you here in a second. Um, hi, my name is Ananya Shah, and we are from Maggie Walker in Richmond, Virginia. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Salantano. Hi, my name is Amanda Perez, and our culture is Mr. Olmschneider. Yes, he is, and a very good one, too. All right, as Emily said, this is being recorded. Joe said a little while ago, because this this is probably going to go viral before 3 o'clock your time, so we better, <laughs> we better go ahead and record this so everybody can watch it and know what y'all were telling us about. So I'll read this real fast. Uh, this is question two. There, this is a, a letter, a quote from a letter from John Adams, of course. There is nothing I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its own leader and in opposition to each other. What issues led to the formation of the original political parties? To what extent have those issues persisted in American political parties today? And what are the advantages and disadvantages of a unified or divided government? Our work here is done. Y'all take over and show us the way. In Washington's farewell address, he warned against the baneful effects of the spirit of party, referencing the budding Federalist and Democratic Republicans. They did not mobilize the mass public, but still worried Washington. The original parties formed as the first cabinet proposed policies, and they began the ongoing trend of constitutionalizing political issues. Hamilton calls polarizing debate by proposing a federal bank to assume state debts. Jefferson believed it would harm farmers, and his agrarian vision for America clashed with Hamilton's industrial one. The Necessary and Proper Clause constitutionalized the debate with Jefferson arguing for strict constitutional interpretation. The income tax featured a similar partisan struggle over congressional economic powers. Article 1, Section 8 states Congress's power to lay and collect taxes. 
The court agreed with Republicans and enraged populists and Pollock v. Farmers Loan Trust by ruling the federal income tax unconstitutional. A partisan policy disagreement became a constitutional matter, and the 16th Amendment's subsequent ratification parallels the legitimization of the bank in McCulloch v. Maryland. Partisan divides over congressional economic powers persist. For example, Democrats felt Congress could legislate health care with the ACA, while Republicans felt it exceeded federal power. Parties again turned to the court in NFIB v. Sebelius. The court split its decision. Democrats approved the preservation of the individual mandate, while Republicans agreed the necessary and proper clause didn't permit all elements. Another salient issue facing the parties was the extent of state and federal constitutional power. After the Sedition Act, Madison and Jefferson wrote the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions to dispute the Article VI Supremacy Clause. They argued states could hold federal laws unconstitutional, once again politicizing the Constitution. State and federal powers remain an area of partisan constitutional debate. As shown in Brnovich v. DNC, Democrats and Republicans disagree over the extent of federal regulation of state voting laws. In this ongoing case, Democrats assert greater federal control of Arizona's election laws through Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act and the 15th Amendment. Conversely, Republicans assert greater state regulatory power to maintain election integrity. As Great Britain and France went to war, Federalists urged a British trade alliance, while Democratic Republicans supported the French. In 1793, Washington unilaterally declared neutrality, setting a controversial precedent for executive power. Congress settled the debate between Ham Ham Hamilton and Madison by legitimizing Washington's statement with the Neutrality Act, but the constitutional question remained ripe for future partisan divisions. The Vietnam War exemplifies the extent to which foreign policy divides parties and calls executive wartime powers into question. In 1964, Congress pressured Johnson to exert firm military power in Vietnam, but by 1969, Democrats feared escalation. Congress tried to ease party tensions with the War Powers Act, preventing abuse of the Commander-in-Chief Clause by limiting the President's ability to enter war without congressional approval. Divided government ideally fosters deliberation to better represent the country's interests. For example, the 2018 First Step Act took over a year to negotiate in divided government. The founders encouraged deliberation with the separation of powers and Article I's bicameral design of Congress. Federalist 63 states the Senate protects against some strong passion or momentary interest. However, divided government can grind governing to a halt, as seen with government shutdowns from 95 to 96 and in 2013. The threat of the president's veto is often used during divided government, like when Truman regularly vetoed tax cuts from the Republican Congress. Also, divided government prevents parties from acting according to the responsible party model because constituents can't analyze either party's impact or hold them accountable. Conversely, a unified government facilitates this model because voters can hold the party in power responsible for the impact of its policies. In the 2010 midterms, Democrats received a shellacking due to high unemployment, the contentious ACA, and the Tea Party movement. Unfortunately, only internal party divisions and powerful external sources like lobbying check unified governments, therefore limiting thoughtful deliberation. Jack Raycove coined, Americans constitutionalize their politics and politicize their constitution, which Democrats, which parties have demonstrated from 1792 to today. Judge Miles, I believe you're muted. That's the most I've heard on this subject in 240 seconds in my entire life, I think. that was, I'd love to have a copy of that when this is over and just sit quietly and read it over to absorb all of that. That was amazing. Dr. Rogers, uh, you want to take this group on? Absolutely. So uh, yeah, over the course of, of American history, has the party system, as you've described it, failed at any point? failed as a system of governance, broken down. I would certainly argue that in the 1860s during the Civil War, the party system did not cooperate as intended. Um, with the Republican Party coming to prominence, um, Southern Democrats began to um, began to draft secession um, do documents that would um, enact them, that would allow them to secede from the Union, um, demonstrating that they did not believe that deliberation was a thoughtful solution to the issue of slavery. Furthermore, I would argue during our early party history, parties were some of the most ineffective, although they did not necessarily fail. For example, um, when the Sedition Act was passed, that was clearly a violent violation of the First Amendment, and yet it persisted. So that was not necessarily a failure, but definitely a low, low point for parties. At this point in time, I think it's important to realize that the two-party system is incredibly different than um, party systems of the past, especially as John Aldrich 
uh, recognize that the party in electorate is extremely weak right now. The majority of Americans actually identify as independents. And I think that that inability to uh, reach the public and that dissatisfaction in the public with parties is in a sense a failure of the two party system to really reach a broad coalition of people. Doc, you good? Doc, um, yeah, I want to get back to you. You talked about um, divided government sometimes leading to deliberation and sometimes leading to gridlock. When does it lead to one and when does it lead to the other? Can we identify conditions that would push it one way or the other? Certainly, I think the most common time for the parties to gridlock is on the issue of um, fiscal policy, specifically the budget. Um, in the last 10 to 15 years, the government has shut down numerous times on October 1st because the parties cannot come to a compromise on the budget. And it leads to several weeks sometimes of parties trying to compromise, yet each time the party simply defaults to last year's budget. Um, and I think that that refusal to compromise is the hallmark of what gridlock um, stems from. An example of compromise and deliberation, however, would definitely be during Eisenhower's term, where he broadly was faced with a Democratic Congress as a Republican president. And he was able to build coalitions broadly from the North and the South to pass different important pieces of legislation. For example, he was able to pass the Federal Highway Act. Joe, you want to follow up? Yeah, because uh, that is a good example in the Eisenhower situation. He's able to build that coalition, but it violates what you talked about with the responsible party model. That is, he, he pulls together Democrats and re conservative Democrats from the South and Republicans. So uh, the responsible party model suggests that voters ought to be able to vote for uh, someone from their political party and know how they will uh, know how they'll vote. I mean, is is does it take something like that to to produce what you're talking about here? Well, Judge, you're certainly right that within divided government, there is it's harder for the responsible party model to come into effect because parties people the people can't accurately analyze just exactly who which party is putting in place this legislation. You're absolutely correct in that aspect. However, I would think it would go back to the model of understanding what kind of representative we should have, either the political model or others that decide whether the representative should necessarily represent exactly what the people want rather than voting what they truly believe. And even um, still, for example, Truman dealt with the Republican controlled Congress, but he still got support to send aid to Western Europe, which was not really uh, sending aid to foreign countries was not part of the Republican um, platform, but by uh, being able to compromise on specifically Western Europe, it was a way to uh, work around that responsible party model in a way that still supported um, Republican uh, core values. I hadn't asked this question all day, but at least the first part of it, but Maggie Walker is one of the most amazing schools in the country. And if we ever forget that, Emily reminds us. Um, if you, if you polled the senior class at Maggie Walker, what percentage of them would have any idea what political party they favor, uh, whether they had an opinion about which political party they thought was right. And of that group, how many of them made that decision by virtue of social media? So I would certainly say that because our school is uniquely focused on international issues that most likely around 80 to 85 percent of our senior class would identify with one political party or the other. Um, and our school is quite liberal leaning, so they would certainly mostly identify with the Democratic Party. However, I certainly think that the majority would be getting their information from Instagram specifically. Um, and I think that that is a problem with um, the way that party propaganda has started to infiltrate the internet. For example, we've seen congressional what investigation. What the party seen, propaganda? I would respond to that. Um, for example, we've seen in congressional investigations into Facebook and how they allow parties um, to often disseminate news that may not be 100% truthful, and it certainly reaches the lowest level of the electorate. 
I would also argue that beyond social media, just the internet as a whole has diversified the amount of news and media that people consume and the way that they consume it. We saw for a while that there were only three TV channels and most people were getting their news from Walter Cronkite. So that's certainly yeah. a shift from to now where you can broadly live inside of a thought bubble, whether it be liberal or conservative. And this has a unique um, interaction with the First Amendment and how um, parties are broadly allowed to have a First Amendment. And it's really hard in um, on the internet to uh, have these fact checking sources uh, to make sure that uh, people are really being accurate in the information they are uh, spreading. Do you so what about third parties? Yeah, go ahead, Nan. Uh, Would third general, parties improve our system? I certainly think that third parties would improve our system. However, I think that the Electoral College laid out in Article 2, Section 1, broadly discourages third parties from running as they are not able to reach the um, vote count of 270 delegates required. Um, so I would say that to in order to allow third parties to infiltrate our system, we could move to a proportional system of representation as seen in Israel. You get the last word. That's right. Emily, go get a cup of coffee. The three of us are going to stay here with them for a little while and keep talking. Come back in about an hour. We'll be right. With you. Yeah. yeah, congratulations to you on that. Um, I'll withhold my thoughts for a minute and let these guys go first. Dr. Rogers, I think you can. Uh, so um, I like your presentation. Uh, you uh, uh, hit all the parts of the question very well. Um, you had a good introduction on the differences be between the parties in the beginning, there's particularly your ideological standpoint. Uh, and I like your strategy of taking the issues and look at them in the 1790s and then you give it a more modern example to show how uh, the issues uh, continued. Uh, uh, one example would be uh, foreign policy, uh, where you talked about the, the uh, U.S. reaction to uh, war in France, uh, Washington's declaration of neutrality, uh, that was uh, divisive. And then compare that to the Vietnam War era, where that was a, a very uh, divisive uh, war. So that that is a good example of showing that you know the issues uh, uh, do uh, uh, come back. Um, um, so on the question when the party system uh, failed, I thought you made a very interesting point, um, and that is that um, you know, this sort of gets at the issue of what does success and failure mean, and one uh, one uh, measure that you uh, implied was a party successful when it represents the voters. And you're suggesting that, that the parties are falling away from that because as you indicate, the party affiliation is declining, you know, and the parties are so, somewhat become independent, you know, of the voting base, the large number of independents. Um, I thought that was, uh, uh, that, that was a really good point. I uh, wish we had more time to talk about the third party uh, option. Uh, you're right, the electoral college does create an obstacle but does that mean third parties are completely, you know, uh, blocked? I'd like to hear more on that. But overall, yeah. good, you know, intelligent presentation. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. We also wish we could talk more about third parties. We've. <laughs> Bet you would. Well, and, and you, you also, I mean, you, you were headed in the right direction there because it's not just focusing on the electoral college, which of course is problematic in moving at the presidential level. But once you get to the alternative voting systems that you mentioned, and I wish we had time to talk about, there are ways of, of trying to promote uh, third party participation, at least at the sub-presidential level. Uh, that's where I, I would have wished we'd have more time to go, go into uh, some of these things because uh, you, you talk about, and I'll tell John that he was cited as, uh, as somebody of having to do with Party, uh, party identification in the electorate. Uh, I think it's a little bit more complicated than that because if you take some of those people that respond that they're independents and press them and say, yeah, but which way do you lean? You know, you can push them toward, and, toward one party or the other, and guess what? That's the way they fairly reliably vote. But you touched on a lot of the important issues, the whole idea of, of representational role. Um, I wish we'd had time to deal with some, some more examples. I think we find examples of where uh, the Republican Party has been in favor of more national exercising 
national power uh, also. In response to my question about when we get, uh, get a deliberation or when we get gridlock, you're able to give me more examples. In the future, take a step back and think about those conditions. Now, you were good by saying, well, we get gridlock when it's about fiscal policy. That's a good way of approaching it. Is it by policy domain or is it some other type of uh, situation? All, again, I just thought it was a, a very well done, uh, very well done presentation. Good job. Thank you. Thank you. Sometimes we hear an essay and, and we think to ourselves, thank heavens they managed to get through that. When we heard yours, what I wanted you to do, and I may ask you to do that, is scan me a copy of it and let me just sit and read through it slowly. You had to pick so pack so many things in there. We really could have spent an afternoon seminar going through your essay. It was that good. I would like to read it. It was really powerfully done. I don't know what to tell you at the end. You know how well prepared you were. You know how well you did today. I'm concerned about the echo chambers. There was a group a little while ago that answered one of Dr. Stewart's questions by saying, well, when you stop and think about it, and Dr. Stewart said, yeah, when we got to the judge, he said, yeah, if you would actually do it, if you would actually stop and think about it. I think the echo chambers are going to get worse unless you can get people your age to stop listening to them or stop mm -hmm. pulling them up. I don't, you know, I, I, I would like to say, go watch the right one, go read the right one, go listen to the right one, but that doesn't always happen. Figure out something to give people something else to look at or listen to or research that's not a one-sided echo chamber and you may do them a real favor um, because there's not enough people my age that are willing to do it and we're not going to be able to change their minds. This program has raised some questions in high school students' minds in other schools where it would never have been raised in their lives. In your case, you're way beyond that. You're to the point of analyzing the answers to the questions. And so you analyze a way to get other people to think to your depth and you will do us all a favor. Now, I always try to do this for him in closing. Um, after tomorrow night, since this is such a large and complex team, after tomorrow night, y'all take Samuel out for a drink. He's earned it. Take him to his favorite place and, uh, and take him out for a drink and he can text us all and let us know that you did it. Good luck the rest of the way. This was delightful. And it was a good way. This is our 24th group in two days. And it was the perfect, perfect way to end. Emily, thank you for not putting us in a bad breakout room and letting us spend time with them. We're at your disposal. Thank you so much for taking the time out of, I'm sure you're busy.